Welcome to Marin Voices and Views. With Lawrence A. Strick, I'm Peter B. Collins. In our second segment today, we'll talk with Joe Hegedus, Managing Director of the Marin Partnership to End Homelessness. First, we welcome Supervisor Judy Arnold back to our program. In the June election, she faced a tough challenge from realtor Tony Schroyer and won re-election by 215 votes out of 11,000 cast. Congratulations, Supervisor. Thank you very much. It's good to see you again, Nice Judy. to be here. What was the message that voters were sending in this election, particularly in your district in Novato? Well, the message was that they wanted to see me continue as a supervisor. Whether you won by 215 votes or you won by five, the point is I won. And it was a, a long campaign and we visited a lot of people and we did a lot of mail and I think the voters wanted to see me back. Now clearly it was very low voter turnout mm -hmm. and um, I've had many many people say oh my gosh I didn't know it was going to be close I thought you were just going to walk in and I just didn't go to vote and I think that could be part of it but um, the point is they want to see me continue and we didn't see that happen around the United States in the congressional races so I feel very very happy. Mm -hmm. in, in fact in the same election your colleague Susan Adams yes uh, in that race she was defeated by Damon Conley right. by about 20 percentage points yeah. and in the Sun in the Pacific Sun Peter uh, Sedman wrote uh, that he saw some wave a wave of new conservatism mm -hmm. in Marin County um, and he speculates that that's because of the concern about uh, the, the growth along the 101 corridor uh, for mm -hmm. housing uh, and people don't want that and of course if they don't want that they're putting the whole big picture of Marin and, mm -hmm. and keeping Western Marin pristine right. in jeopardy so there, there's all kinds of things mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. But as we think about it, um, is Marin becoming more of an exclusionary county and are people just getting more conservative and more comfortable to voice that conservatism uh, without thinking? Um, I would say yes there is a there is a movement I'm not sure how big it is but I think it is it is definitely there and you hear it when people do say uh, we're uh, we want local control that's the most important thing. And then if you try to talk to them on the level of local control, a mask goes up, a veil goes up, and they don't hear it. And I think it's very much um, aligned to what the Tea Party does. They've done a, sto a study at Berkeley of two incidences, one in Atlanta when they wanted to put in um, a bus system, a rapid bus system, and in, the east, in Marin County when they wanted to do Plan Bay Area. And the Plan Bay area, they did a, the professors did a whole scenario on this and said, when people say local control, when people uh, don't want to listen, when people say, when you get code words like it's going to bring in crime, affordable, they, they've added high density housing when no one in Marin wants high density. We don't want to build six story units except probably the Corte Madera City Council with Wind Cup. But nowhere else in this county do you see people wanting that. But that's the, the, that's the word they use to scare people and to say crime will be rampant. And at one point they even set two people at different meetings on housing. One person said, if, if you bring in affordable housing here, it will change the complexion of Novato. I think that's telling. And, um, and another man got up in the hearing before the board and said, just ask yourself this. Would you want your daughter to date someone who lives in affordable housing? Hmm. So people are getting much bolder. <laughs> well, and I was at a meeting that Supervisor Adams held where realtor Melissa Bradley said that building affordable housing in Marinwood was bringing the ghetto 
yeah. to Marin. Yes. And you recently, you've brought a copy with you, but mm -hmm. you read a letter at the Board of Supervisors meeting mm -hmm. that came from a, a local resident and that really shocked you. So tell us uh, who it is, who wrote the letter, and read whatever you'd like from it. It's a, it came from a Dr. Robert Frankel. He lives in San Rafael, and he has, he's an allergist, and he's also on the Academy of Pediatrics. And he has an office in Greenbrae and an office in Nevada on Hill Road. And I will just be happy to read part of the letter. He's um, uh, telling me that, you know, I, I should beware of, of the, the narrow victory that I had. And then he said, hopefully the message has been received. Marin does not want high-density housing. Um, Adams dumped 72 units of refuse into Marin Wood. We do not want ill-behaved, ignorant, irresponsible, welfare landfill dumped in our communities to trash our neighborhoods and schools. We don't want transit villages imposed on us by ABAG and its unelected elite of social planner bureaucrats. Um, diversity is supposed to be good for you, like Brussels sprouts and castor oil. If someone wants, they are welcome to it in such wonderful communities such as Vallejo, Richmond, and Oakland. There they can find all the diversity and murders and crime that they want. We don't need eight-year-olds murdered at sleepovers and two-year-old toddlers killed in front of their parents' truck. Do let me know when the multi-generational welfare clients in Marin City behave like civilized persons instead of endlessly attacking bus riders and law enforcement. And when I read this at the board, I, I said to the, it was during Supervisor Matters, and I said, you know, this is some of the things that we're facing today, and I think it's time that we call it out when we see it and that we don't be afraid to name names, and I would hope they would do it too. Now, the next day, a message came into my office from Dr. Frankel. Um, saying that um, uh, he wanted me to call him because, you know, he, I didn't let him know that I was going to read the letter. And I did call him back, and when he answered the phone, the first thing he said was, <clears throat> you know, um, I really think the senior housing project at Warner Creek in Novato is, is nice. And something sort of like my best friends or mm. whatever. Yeah. Anyway. Um, but, but the tone of that letter is really segregationist. Very, Judy. very. I mean, he, he's basically saying keep every, that keep he wants to be in a gated community mm -hmm. where no uh, pathological behaviors would be permitted. Right. And that, to me, it does typify this mentality, which is to say, People want to lock Marin in place mm -hmm. when it comes to uh, expanding housing opportunities for other people. Mm -hmm. But they also say, I want the right to tear down what we have and build a McMansion, right. Uh, right. you know, to my, uh, mm -hmm. to my liking. Mm -hmm. So there's this disconnect that, that people, you know, I think on the extremes are expre expressing a kind of entitlement mm -hmm. that, that, you know, we paid what we did to get in here mm -hmm. and we have the right to exclude other people in order to preserve what we have. Well, what strikes me about this guy's letter, I, I don't know this guy from Adam, mm -hmm. but the, he offers nothing positive. So, so, no. what, so what's his solution? Yeah. I right. mean, you know, okay, doctor, <laughs> you know, help us out here. Uh, you know, this is, you know, we need to move forward. We can't live in, in a bubble. We can't live mm -hmm. without any movement. People have to the do The solution things. is we do have to provide affordable right. housing. And if we don't, and if we do it out of prejudice, a HUD has their eyes on Marin County. We could be in the same shape as Westchester County and be sued for $68 million for discrimination against keeping minorities and people that are protected under Title VI out. Hmm. That's the danger. Well, maybe he'll contribute to the, to the settlement pool from his practice. Maybe we could call and ask him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about the grand jury. Uh, for years, everyone thought the grand jury, you know, I still think some of people... And, and let's call it the civil grand jury. Civil, yes, please. Different. <laughs> yeah, the civil grand jury. Yeah, so. there, there's no ham sandwich to be indicted today. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like when the lawyer gets corrected by the <laughs> I, I really don't. But anyway, let's talk about the civil grand jury, and that was a very uncivilized comment to me. Um, 
doing a pretty good job monitoring things that were going mm -hmm. on in the rain. Lately, however, particularly as they looked at Knott's Field mm -hmm. up in, in Nevada, mm -hmm. um, there's been some, some talk that they're really trying to micromanage what's going on here. Mm -hmm. what, what are your views on, on the grand jury and are they being helpful or unhelpful as, as we move forward on that? Well, I think the grand jury, the civil grand jury, um, does a, has done a good job and, and really helpful job in, in getting in, digging into the issues and pointing things out. The things that I disagree with them on are the Nosfield report and the SMART report. Um, and I think that Nosfield has, first of all, Nosfield is, is, our airport is hampered because it, there's no septic. And so they're not, they're, it's not going to be a, a thriving metropolis with the airport as the center. But what it is going to be is it's going to help business people who use who come in and out. Angel flights fly in there with organs to be taken to hospitals and fly burn victims to Oakland. And the sheriff has a patrol plane there. All of those things could be vital for us if we have a catastrophe like an earthquake, because this could they could land, they could get out when maybe the roads are, are bad or the bridges are down. So I think the county is doing a good job. There's a new organization that I have been involved with in the beginning called Nosfield Community Association, composed of pilots and of people who own businesses there like Scanlon Aeronautics. And they're doing a lot to, to raise the profile of NOS. And it's, I invite people to go out there and take a look. So the other grand jury report that you referred civil. to from the civil grand jury, <laughs> is uh, critical of the work of the uh, board of SMART, the mm -hmm. Sonoma Marin mm -hmm. Train. You mm -hmm. chair that board. I do. And the grand jury says, quote, the board needs to be more active and that some board members, quote, do not have an adequate understanding of the financial and system operating issues. Is this fair criticism? I don't think it is. I think that the grand jury uh, was contacted by people, the civil grand jury was contacted by, by people that have always been opposed to SMART, that worked hard to recall it this last time, and I think they came in predisposed with questions. Um, why don't they ask TAM, the Transportation Authority of Marin, ask the board of that, which I'm vice chair of that, do you know what your, item four of your strategic plan? No but we know how to make policy and we know how to make sure that the executive director implements it. And that's exactly what's happening with SMART. Now, the, the dip, there's, there's one difference because we are just beginning operations, because we are involved in land use, we have a lot of closed sessions because you have to, because legally our lawyers say you have to. So a lot of where you see the board giving direction to staff is done in closed session. But I think SMART, I think SMART's doing a great job. Um, and, and you were originally opposed to it. I, I voted against it both yeah. times. Yeah, I did. I did. So you know those opponents. I know them well. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah. So I think SMART is, is going, to, going to start. I think it's going to be more popular than people think. I think it's going to be great for weekend recreation, and I do think it's going to take cars off 101. Mm -hmm. I we have a last question for you as we're running out of time. In our second segment, we're going to be talking to a, a gentleman who is working with the, the homeless problem here in Marin. Um, what's the county's participation in homeless services, and what is your position or the county's position on Ritter House, and should it leave downtown San Rafael? Well, the, the, what our, count, our county's done a lot for the homeless. We open up our health and wellness center in San Rafael for women and children during the, the cold weather. And then ch the churches, the Marine Organizing Council, takes care of the men and they house the men. So that's been going on for several years. That's the REST program. The REST program. We have also put in a half a million dollars to help find a place and to help with Homeless Now. And we're working closely with San Rafael to try to find a place. San Rafael years ago said, we've done enough and we don't, we don't want to, you to buy a building here when the county was ready to buy one to put the homeless in. I think that sentiment has changed and I think San Rafael is saying, okay, if, if you would partner with us county, which we'll do, and find a, you know, a permanent place, I think we'd be very receptive to that. Um, what was your second? Well, is that a, is that a downtown San Rafael? 
Hotel. Oh, Ritter House. Well, I mean, you know, that's something that, that comes under the purview of the San Rafael City Council. But I, I visited Ritter. I've gone through it. I think it has served a huge need. And um, it really takes care of the poorest of the poor. And that's one of the charges we needed. we need and, to do. And if we move it from downtown, it will be hard for the community that needs the service to access it, won't it? Unless they can find shuttle buses that will take them. But yes, that's one of the things to realize. It's mm -hmm. right in the center of where it should be. Judy Arnold, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Joining us now is Joe Hegedus, Managing Director of Marin Partnership to End Homelessness, a coalition of 30 organizations and community groups which provide housing and other related services to folks here in Marin. Joe, welcome. Tell us a little bit about your group, who's members, and uh, give us a little bit about your mission statement. Okay, thank you for having me, first of all. Um, my organization, again, is called the Marin Partnership to End Homelessness, and we try and serve as a hub for the nonprofits in Marin County, providing services to low income and uh, people experiencing homelessness in Marin County. Um, our mission is to, to lead the community uh, to collectively ensure that people become and remain housed. So we want to facilitate a system of care in Marin that helps people uh, prevent, prevent them from becoming homeless and if they do uh, become homeless then work to assist them to get back into housing as quickly as possible. Are your members uh, other nonprofits in the faith community or who, who yeah, Generally it's, it's nonprofits. Um, we do have some other groups, the small businesses, um, advocates and other folks in the community that are, are participants, but the core is the nonprofit uh, service provider community. And Joe, can you give us a profile of the homeless population in Marin? Uh, how many of them are single moms with kids? How many of them are uh, males who, you know, are living alone? Uh, and, uh, you know, how many of them are, are working poor as opposed to people who are just flat out broke and homeless? Sure. Well, it's, uh, the demographics are, cover a wide range of, of areas and types of populations and that sort of thing. Um, in terms of Families uh, experiencing homelessness, uh, the last, we do a count every two years, and that's where we get the bulk of our data. Um, and the last count was in 2013. We had 99 households with children um, that, made, that was um, 179 children in those households. So a big chunk of the homeless population is the kind of unseen, you know, working poor folks that are living in vehicles, families, um, and, and maybe just you know, not have a place to stay at night but are going to work and, and kind of living the rest of their lives normally. Um, there is obviously a, a segment of the population that is, is what's considered chronically homeless. Um, so those folks have been out for, on the streets for a longer time. Um, and that's generally about 20% of the, the overall population. Mm -hmm. um, but again, there's, you know, a broad mix of folks experiencing homelessness. Um, and it can be from a range of reasons and causes. And, and what percentage roughly have substance abuse issues? Uh, well, nationally, there's about an average of about 20 percent. Um, and, you know, substance abuse and homelessness are, are kind of a, a chicken and the egg questions. You know, a lot of the time, one can exacerbate the other and, and perpetuate mm -hmm. the other. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, they're not, usually not exclusive and they can result the longer you are out. Um, you know, you can have greater experiences of, of substance abuse and mental health concerns. In Marin, that occurrence is a little bit lower um, than it has been nationally, but not much. It's, it's still mm -hmm. around that same. I, I think there's also a uh, perception that homeless people um, ha somehow have criminal records or committing crimes against other homeless people or increase the risk to folks who just live in the community. Mm -hmm. How would you characterize that issue in Marin? Well, I mean, obviously, you know, in any sector of society, you're going to have folks that are not going to adhere to the rules and regulations and normal behaviors that are out there. And, and that is, is obviously a, a smaller segment of the, of the overall people experiencing homelessness in Marin. But they're the most visible, the most, um, you know, kind of in your face in the community um, in terms of the impact. And there is a level of uh, criminal behavior. Um, and, you know, obviously, if people are, are misbehaving, they're, that's when the police should be uh, brought in. But the hope is, is that you know, if they've already served their time or if they have been through jail, that we can help them address whatever put them there in the first place. So if it's family issues, health issues, financial issues, 
you know, addressing those problems um, to not have them, you know, return back to criminal behavior. Well, and some people, to be fair, uh, have a criminal record that's related to being impoverished and homeless. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Not through, you know, uh, violent crimes or, or willful uh, law-breaking. Now, one of the problems we've seen this summer that is a higher risk because of the drought is that in San Rafael and Corte Madera in particular, uh, homeless people have been camping out and building fires, and then the fires get out of control. Yeah. Uh, wh what do you see as the cause of that, and uh, what, what would you do to address it? Uh, well, there's a lot of different factors that would go into that. I mean, it, obviously the amount of shelter space we have available and supportive housing, transitional housing, is limited in Marin. Um, there's always a, a greater need than the availability of space. So addressing that gap is, is going to be an important aspect of this. Um, and then, of course, the enforcement and making sure that we minimize the opportunities for encampments being set up. Um, you know, the Marin is abundantly, has an abundant open space um, and, you know, to be able to control that will be difficult. There's going to be coordinated efforts with the cities and the fire departments to clean out these campsites to reduce the overgrowth. Um, and these are happening as, as we speak in San Rafael and Corte Madera. So there's mm -hmm. kind of a multifaceted approach of doing outreach and then also kind of the prevention of the fires and encampments. On the positive side of this, for the last year, San Rafael has had uh, the San Rafael Streets team. And in my understanding is it, it, it hired people who are down in the luck homeless uh, to, to do public service, mm -hmm. to, to clean the streets. Uh, it's been remarkably uh, successful from what I hear. And the IJ just suggested that the funding be continued to continue it. What's your view of that program, and where do you see it going in the year or years to come? Sure. I, I, they're, I think they're a great addition to, the, like I've mentioned, the system of care we have in Marin. There's multiple facets to it, and they're a critical component of, that, of the initial outreach effort. You know, They're kind of one of the front lines in terms of service organizations that are out there connecting with folks that may not be connected to other agencies. Um, so in that sense, they're a great benefit to the community. They, they really help with that initial contact and building, you know, those basic um, rapport and, and relationships with folks that may not want to connect with services otherwise. Um, the difficulty, I think, for them has been, you know, finding housing, finding, you know, sustainably paying jobs for folks. I mean, that's the difficulty for any, any family or anybody in Marin County. Um, so it's, it's not without its obstacles, but it, in it, as you mentioned, the They've been very successful. The number of folks that they've helped has far surpassed the original expectations. So. And, and part of the help is actually landing these people, paying new productive jobs. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. And um, not only just landing them jobs, but helping maintain the job and you know, keep up the, the benefits that come from that you know, of, of self-sufficiency and hopefully eventually finding housing and, and the other things that can go along with it. Joe, uh, San Rafael's mayor, Gary Phillips, has made it pretty clear that he wants to move services for the homeless out of the downtown area, and in particular, Ritter House. Do you see realistic alternatives for a permanent shelter that's accessible to people without cars? And won't that just shift the problem to another area, like a leaf blower? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a great uh, analogy. I mean, it's, the problem arises in finding a place that works for the entire community. Um, you know, obviously there will be some concerns from neighborhoods that are surrounding a specific site if it's chosen. And then also there are issues around accessibility, um, access to transportation, and you know, the, the condition of the building. So there's a lot of factors that make finding a site um, difficult. And you've been working on that. Yes, you? there's a, a, a group of, of nonprofits and the county and, and the city representatives that are doing just that to find not only sites for shelter, but permanent housing, supportive housing, you know, the kind of the array of service needs that we have in Marin County. Mm -hmm. um, but the, nothing has, no golden egg has arisen yet, so um, we just have to keep looking and, and see what we can find. Your partnership actually uh, has a hands-on or direct service up in Hamilton that provides transitional housing. Correct. Okay, what, what does trans transitional housing mean to people and how has it been working in the neighborhood up there? 
So transitional housing is uh, basically it's a supportive housing program for people that have gone through the shelters, uh, the domestic violence shelter, the inpatient drug and alcohol treatment programs, and it serves as a second step for them um, if they're not able to find housing after that initial um, intake program. So people, once they're referred to us, they get up to two years to live in our units. They pay in a, a percentage of their income towards the rent. And hopefully in those two years, find permanent housing, take care of employment, um, health, whatever it is. And overall, we've been successful. Recently, it's been more difficult to find uh, places for people to move to just because the availability of housing in general is, is low. So um, we're actually looking at transitioning or changing our model to get rid of that two-year time frame um, and give people a little more leeway just in terms of uh, you know, the length of time it takes to get them on back on their feet. How, how did you get the inventory of housing? Well, when the Hamilton base was decommissioned, there was a requirement by the Navy to include affordable housing, homeless services, and, and transitional housing. So we had a great opportunity when the Hamilton base was decommissioned. Um, which Marin will probably never see again in terms of the bulk of units that were available or developed then. Um, but you mentioned, you know, the community reaction and involvement. And we've had a great participation and re relationship with our neighbors in Hamilton. And uh, that's not been through, you know, it's taken a lot of work and energy to really foster those relationships. And I think that's an important part of being successful for any program anywhere is really um, ensuring that they're fitting in with the neighborhood and the community. Joe, just a minute remaining. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell us what the plans are for sheltering the homeless in Marin this coming winter. Sure. Um, so as I'm sure many folks have known, there's what's called the Rotating Emergency Shelter uh, Program, REST program, which has kind of filled the, the gap in terms of shelter during the winter months. And um, there's a hope to find a kind of permanent home for that program, but it may not come to fruition by winter. So the hope is that we can have that rotating shelter one more year this winter while we look for the permanent location. And, and that's uh, generally in, in churches and yes, synagogues around the county. Yes, the congregations through the Marine Organizing Committee uh, have volunteered their, their time, their space to, to help uh, people have a place for the night. Mm -hmm. Joe Hegedus, thanks for joining us today from the Marin Coalition, the Partnership to End Homelessness. Thank you for having me.